Okay, we are live and uh, welcome everyone to the third and last uh, MSR tutorial. Uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome Philip Kren from Elasticsearch, uh, who's gonna give a tutorial about this awesome technology, which is Elasticsearch, and I invite everyone to give it a try because it's, it's really awesome. I use it intensively myself. Uh, Philip is uh, a developer advocate and MIA team lead at Elastic. He has extensive uh, knowledge and experience uh, as in a number of companies and startups in the past uh, on a number of different roles. And, uh, oh, sorry, I forgot. My name is Marco D'Ambros and I'm going to chair this session. Just a couple of uh, logistical information. If you have questions, please post them on the chat and uh, Philip will uh, have a look or I can, I can uh, ask the questions. At the end of the session, we'll be transferred to a different room. You will get a pop-up on the bottom right, so please click there. We will uh, make an announcement towards the end and then we will have more time for Q&A at the end. So Philip, thanks again. The stage is all yours and uh, go ahead. Thanks a lot for having me. Hi, everyone. So. Um... I'm Philip. I want to talk a bit about full text search with Elasticsearch, which is probably the most widely used full text search engine you have out there. Like we said, don't be shy. If you have any questions, just write in chat. I have it on a second screen and I will try to keep an eye on that. So without further ado, let's jump in. Um, who is using a database? And I normally give this talk like in person and I would see your hands. And now I assume like a lot of you are using databases. And then I always ask, like, so who is using full text search or what is even the difference between a database and full text search? And I, I will assume that most of you have like an idea of what a relational database is and what it does. And now the question is, how does it differentiate from full text search? And I always explain it with this picture where the, the black and white part on the left hand side here, that is basically the database because the database is very good at answering a question and it's like, um, you run a query and then it gives you the, the final answer and it's yes or no, or it finds a string or it doesn't find it. Whereas search is much more about these shades of gray. Um, so it's not so much about like when I type a search query into Google, then I would search for pullover. Um, maybe I want to see pullovers as well. Um, so in the plural, or I might want to find a synonym. So it's not just this black and white, like give me this exact thing, but search is much more about the, the concept that you're looking for, or also generally the expectation. So if you go to a web shop and you type in some term, you expect some results to come back that are more or less closely related to that. So it's much more about these shades of gray, um, finding some relevant information and probably fast, rather than having this more strict approach of databases, which are very good at having an exact match. Um, but don't do like these nuances or things that are related. Um, and that's kind of where Elasticsearch comes into the picture. So Elasticsearch is the most widely used full text search engine out there. Um, and it is behind many websites or projects um, where you can use it. So if you search on Stack Overflow, Wikipedia, GitHub, behind the search box, there is always Elasticsearch doing that search query for you. And in this talk, I want to show you a bit like full text search in general, because all of these concepts apply very widely, but also the specific queries will be with Elasticsearch. Um, so let's dive into that. I've already been introduced. Um, thanks for that. So I'm a developer advocate. I know mostly talk about stuff that you can do. And I always say my goal as successful users to show you what is possible um, and to fix your problems and kind of like set you on the right path to be successful with our technology. That's kind of like my role. So one of the big differentiators between databases and full text search engine is that databases basically store what comes in and full text search does more work when it stores it so that it can retrieve stuff faster afterwards. Um, and I see that a lot of you are already using full text search. Um, we will probably, I'll ask you a couple of times um, if 
you're familiar with concepts or not, and then we can go a bit lighter or deeper on some concepts. So in the case of Elasticsearch, the thing that is actually doing the, the search work behind the scenes is the library Apache Lucene, which is more than 20 years old by now. Elasticsearch is a bit over 10 years by now. So I don't want to say they're old projects, but they're well-established projects. Um, and Lucene is basically storing the data on disk and it's doing the actual search work. And Elasticsearch is kind of like the shell around it that you interact with. It has an HTTP interface and you talk to it via JSON documents. So it's classic REST basically. Um, it does the distribution of the data. It does replication. So you have data multiple times in case a node fails. So basically Lucene is the thing that is at the core and Elasticsearch is around it and wraps Lucene and you interact with Elasticsearch. Um, sometimes people ask like, what is the database behind that? There is no other database needed anymore. Lucene is the thing that stores everything on disk. So there is no other relational database or anything in that anymore. To run that, we have a cloud service or you can just run that with Docker because nowadays everything needs to be Docker. So this would be the simplest example of how you could run Elasticsearch um, with Docker, um, giving it one gig of memory, pulling the image in whatever the current version is, like 7.12.1 would be the current one. Um, and then I use Kibana, which is like the UI tool or it's easier to interact with. So I will run all my queries through Kibana, but you could just do the same with curl or anything else that can do HTTP requests. Um, so that is what we'll dive into. So, um, who remembers Star Wars? What was the phrase in the first Star Wars movie or Star Wars is always confusing because what came first or like this was the first movie that was released. Um, I don't want to go into the uh, chronological order of the Star Wars ecosystem. What was the phrase they were saying um, in the first Star Wars movie when he made this hand movement um, when just after he had met Luke for the first time? Does anybody remember? Or who is good with Star Wars? So the phrase was, these are not the droids you are looking for. And we want to take this sentence and look at it, what full text search does with that. Um, so I have added this emphasis tag, the HTML tag, um, and I will basically show you each individual step, what full text search does um, to prepare that to make the queries faster and more efficient and powerful afterwards. So the first thing that we will do is we run a character filter, which is called HTML strip, which basically throws away the formatting of HTML. We assume that the not doesn't have any specific like the, the formatting doesn't mean anything in the terms of the text itself. So we'll just throw that out. Um, next up, we tokenize. Tokenizing is basically breaking up the individual words, which in Western languages is very simple. Um, basically, you break up on white spaces and punctuation marks. You can see the dot at the end is gone because nobody is searching for the dot. We just break up these individual tokens. We can see a bit more space between them. So these are my tokens that I have broken out. In other languages, like in some Asian languages, Tokenizing is a lot harder than in Western languages, but we'll stick to Western languages today and their tokenization is relatively state straightforward. White spaces and punctuation marks is normally what you use just to break up the tokens. Um, then you normally lowercase because most of the times when you search, you don't really case, care about upper and lowercase. So that in the background, you don't need to do a search and you need to search for various upper and lowercase variants or you need to at runtime make it lowercase. We just store everything in lowercase. When we search for it, we'll also search for it in lowercase. And then we never have to worry about the casing anymore. Um, so this will just make your life easier. Should you always lowercase? Maybe not. Sometimes upper and lowercase can have different meanings. So if you have us, or US for United States, those, those might be different concepts. Um, and maybe you don't want to lowercase in specific situations because of that. In most cases, probably you want to lowercase and um, move on here. So next up, we remove the so-called stop words. 
The stop words are very common words that appear in almost any sentence and nobody really searches for them because they are so common. You're not going to find anything relevant because they appear all over the place. So you're not going to find much with them. So here, these are not the droids you are looking for. Um, you can see only droids you looking. These are the only non-stop word words that are remaining here. Um, I see a question about uh, if you have like some uh, non-ASCII characters um, so that one of our favorite question or answers is it depends. Um, so there are rules for many languages. Um, what makes sense? So for example, German has these funny umlauts with the little dots, for example, on, on A and U and O. Um, and in German, linguists have basically decided that those may, don't make a big difference. Um, so when we do the stemming, we throw them out. Um, in Swedish, they also have something that looks like an umlaut, but there it's like a very different letter. And there, you don't remove the dots. There it stays a different um, letter. There is also a filter that is called ASCII fold, where you basically say reduce everything to the, the closest ASCII version of a character. And if you have to deal with multiple languages, for example, and you want to normalize that on ASCII characters, that might be an easy and good way. So there are multiple ways to that. So either you have something language dependent, then there are probably rules for that language, or you could just apply a rule to say like, okay, let's reduce everything to ASCII characters and move on. I hope at that answered the question. Okay. Um, then I see Sina asks, what would you do for tokenizing log files, um, literals, words, IDs, etc." cetera. So um, for, for log files, um, and that's actually a good point. I didn't want to go too much into that, but yes, Elasticsearch is very widely used for log files because it turns out storing the logs is the boring part. What you want to do with logs is you want to find them. Um, so search is very relevant for logs as well. What you normally do there is for logs is that you write a regular expression to parse the individual pieces out. Um, so you would extract, like you have that line of text and it has, a timestamp and it has a log level and it has a log message and maybe it has some key value pairs or whatever. And you would try to parse those out individually. So you could then say like, oh, give me all the log messages from this time frame. And for that, you would want to extract that timestamp to actually assign that and have a time field and not just one big string. Um, but that's not really tokenization. Um, that's like or that's running normally a regular expression against a string to break it up into the, into the individual pieces. Um, so for, for log messages, normally like tokenization to just search for something in your log message, you normally would probably not do stemming or stop word removal because it doesn't make so much sense for many full text search um, or log use cases. Um, I hope that makes sense, Sina. And by the way, if you can log a structured format like JSON and you don't have to write a regular expression to parse it, that is probably a good idea because um, the plural, plural of regex is always regret. Um, writing too many regular expressions is normally painful and you don't want to do that. Um, or I sometimes call it the Stockholm syndrome, where you get so used to writing regular expressions that at some point you start liking it. Um, but enough about logs. Um, that's kind of like a kind of it is in there and we do a lot with logs, um, but it's, I don't want to make that the focus. So um, search is very closely related, but full text search is a, still a slightly different problem. So we have removed the, the stop words, which is a different process than working with the logs. Um, and there is a built-in stop word list, which is obviously language dependent again, um, because the German stop words don't make much sense in English, so you will need to apply the right stop word language. Um, and there is a predefined list of stop words. And for uh, English, this list is actually pretty short. And I always forget if it's 33 or 35 um, words, but there are very few. And it just happened so that in our example sentence here, these are not the droids you're looking for. We had a lot of them, so we removed a lot of those words. Um, Final step that we do is we do um, stemming. Stemming is basically reducing um, the 
the words to their root. Um, so like I had this example early on with the pullover or pullovers, singular or plural. Normally when you do full text search, you don't care about if it's a singular or plural. You just care about the concept. Also, you don't care about the specific form of the verb. So if it's look, looks, or looking, the concept we're looking for is look. Um, or droid or droids, we don't really care about that. So you can stem down to the word root and snowball stemmer is one very, like it's available for multiple languages that has rules basically to do that. By the way, that is rule-based and not dictionary-based. Um, there are also dictionary-based approaches, um, some free, some commercial, that can do more clever stuff. So for example, if you have the verb be and you have is or are, um, those would, by those rules, not be reduced to the same word stem because they don't really have a, an easy word stem where you have some rules. Like in English, it's pretty simple. You throw away the S at the end um, because it's either plural or um, third person singular. Uh, you have ing at the end um, that you would cut off. Um, so there are some simple rules that you can apply. And for a lot of the words that are there in English, because it's a rather simple language in that regard, um, that stemming will work very well. There are other languages where stemming doesn't work so well because the flexions are much stronger. For example, I don't speak Russian, but I've heard that Russian, like a word can change so much in the different forms that stemming there is a lot harder because the word changes so much and it's very it's much harder to find a sensible word root. But for English, which we'll stick for now, um, it's pretty simple. Um, so, and I have been... So let's try that out hands-on. Um, so these are Elasticsearch queries. This is Kibana, if you've never seen it. This here is called console. And basically this is like um, curl. So this is curl, X then localhost 9200, which would be the default port of Elasticsearch. But this is kind of like the, the shorter version. I don't need to specify the domain and the port or anything. I just say get slash. Um, it will run that and it, then it shows me, okay, I'm running the current version of Elasticsearch. And then this one here, this query um, is just simulating. So here I'm using that underscore analyze endpoint and I'm saying this is an English text. Show me what would happen if you would analyze that with the English analyzer. And then it will show me what it does with that text here. So what plops out, and I've already described that, draw it, you look. So you've seen um, we have lowercase it, we have tokenized it, we have removed the stop words, we have stemmed it down. Um, Frida, I, I will come back to your question in a moment um, because that is a more complex question. Um, what I wanted to add here while we're at it, so you can see we have the token. Um, you can also see a position. Um, so this is four. Um, counting, does Elasticsearch start the positions at zero or one? If you count correctly, it should start at one, like any proper IT system. Um, counting starts at uh, zero. Um, why do we need that position? The position comes in handy if we search for a phrase. So for example, if we search for the phrase droid you, which is a weird phrase, but let's assume somebody searches for droid and you, we can basically find documents that contain those two words um, and then check that their positions have N and N plus one basically. And that way, you can very easily identify phrases. Um, the other thing that start and end offset, um, those are relevant for highlighting. So for example, the 18th character is the start of droid. Um, so if you have a very long text and you want to highlight, this is where the hit is in that long text. Um, this is where you could set the marker. And we do all of this work at index time when we store the document so that the search afterwards and the processing afterwards is much faster. Um, that's kind of one of the trade-offs that we do here. Um, so this is what we extract. And you can see alphanumeric is like the type of this token. Um, we Another type um, that we will run into are synonyms. So you can define synonyms. So I think the synonym that I will define is machine for droid. So if somebody find or searches for machine, 
they will also find droids. Um, handling misspellings and abbreviations. There are a couple of ways to do that. Um, so there is something called fuzziness. We'll get to fuzziness, um, which is like the easy runtime way where you can say like, I want to have, it's basically a Levenstein distance. So like edits, so you can have, if you say like a Levenstein distance of one or one edit, it could be one letter is too much, missing or different. Um, and then you can say Levenstein distance of up to two um, because otherwise it finds a lot of unrelated things. Um, so you could do that um, to figure out mistypings. There are also other ways to find like partial words, um, but that's probably too much for the next 30 minutes. Um, so just as an example, um, you will also run into things where um, you have like blueberry and somebody wants to find blue and expects blueberry to be found because blueberries have blue in them. Um, but that doesn't work with those single tokens. So you will need to find, have other approaches. Um, there is also, uh, so there are plugins to have like the sound that a word might make um, depending on how you expect something to be pronounced. Um, that makes sense or doesn't make sense, but yes, there are plugins. Um, so the one that does that for, um, this is how it might be pronounced or sound, um, is not built into Elasticsearch by default. You would need to install that as a plugin, but it's a free plugin. It's just not built in by default because every plugin makes the download a little larger and probably also needs a little memory. Um, since a lot of people don't use that feature, it's not built in, but you can just add the plugin um, and then you could um, search by that as well. Um, okay, so slightly more complex example, it does exactly the same, or it gives you the, exactly the same output as before. And um, now I just added that HTML tag here and I'm running through all the steps that I've shown you before. So first, I strip out the HTML, I use the standard tokenizer, um, I lowercase it, I remove the stop words, I do the snowball stemming, and in the end, you get exactly the same result back that we had before. Draw it, you look. Um, but you can basically change or skip any of these steps. So if you know there is no HTML in your input, um, don't apply that character filter. If you have emojis and want to replace the emojis in your text, um, you could use a character filter to replace the emojis by something else um, or do various other things. Um, if you, for example, have um, something where you don't want to remove the stop words, you could do that too. Um, my favorite example for that is to be or not to be. Those are all stop words applied stop word filter on that phrase, you would never find to be or not to be. Um, so choose wisely how you analyze your text to actually find what you have been looking for. Um, I also have a German example um, because that is the equivalent um, version of uh, the, the movie because, you know, in German, we always dub everything um, and, well, you need to apply the German analyzer. If you use the English one, it will it will not work properly because the stop words don't apply, the stemming rules don't apply, um, and this is what would what the the German um, analyzer would spit out. So you would get draw it, den, and such, and you can see that has been reduced um, here to that. Um, and you could have or add or try out various other languages. Um, you will need to know what language you have to properly work with that. Though we have by now um, tools in Elasticsearch that can try to guess or infer the language from a string. So basically what you could do is you could throw it against that endpoint. It would tell you this is probably Spanish. And then you could use the Spanish analyzer to actually work with that text. Um, Ah, okay, I see a comment about double metaphone searches. Yes, um, so for misspellings, there are a couple of ways. Engrams are another approach, um, but like metaphone could be helpful too. So there are multiple ways to spin that here. 
Um, so let's do another phrase here. So I see another question. Um, Fuzzy Search, um, does online learning match remote study? Uh, no, that is not what Fuzzy Search is. Fuzzy Search is really edits like Levenstein distance. Um, so if you misspell something, um, your example looks more like synonyms where you say online and remote are synonyms and you want to find those. Um, I will show you how to add synonyms and work with them in five minutes or so. Um, okay, I think I got all the questions, um, but keep them coming. It's always good if it's a bit more interactive. So, Obi one never told you what happened to your father. What tokens will we get in the end? Um, anybody wants to guess, or also anybody wants to guess, like how many tokens will Obi one be? Um, and those are things you just need to try out, and then. At some point, you will remember them. Um, so when you run that here, um, you will see OB1, two tokens, because the standard tokenizer breaks up on dashes. You could switch this to the white space tokenizer, for example, which unsurprisingly will only break up on white spaces. Um, but here we get two tokens. So OB1 never told you what happened your father. So the only stop word we have in this one here is two, which just happens because the list of short stop words is pretty short. Um, so sometimes you have a lot of them and sometimes you have don't have a lot of them in the text. Um, final example, um, no, I am your father. Any guesses what remains from I or for I am your father? That one is interesting because it keeps I am your father. Which, by the way, um, also tells you something um, about like search or full text search is by itself pretty dumb because so it doesn't do natural language processing. It doesn't understand your text. It doesn't know if somebody is your father or not your father because no and not are stop words. Um, so they will be removed. So it's really just on that token basis. Um, that it works, it doesn't understand anything, but that makes search both very scalable and very fast. And sometimes dumb but fast and scalable um, beats clever um, and slow for many use cases, which doesn't mean that full text search will not evolve, um, but um, a lot of the basics are not very clever, um, but they're simple enough and get you good enough results. Um, I see a question, do we um, plan to extend to semantic search features um, that go beyond keyword and synonym? Yes, so um, there's a bit of a, a general discussion, like what do you do in semantic search, in machine learning capabilities and everything? Um, so I, I don't want to promise anything here. Um, and also, I think it's still like a bit being made up where the, the journey will go. Um, though for today, I will absolutely only focus on the basics. So everything here will be very, very, yeah, more introductory. Um, it will not have any fancy new features that might be coming. Um, but semantic search in that regard is, I think it's interesting and I, one of the trends I've seen like one or two weeks ago was that people want to have more like sentence-like interactions with search engines and then search engines will kind of like automatically pick up what you mean. Um, I guess we've tried it with Wolfram Search a couple of years ago um, and it might do another round now and come back. Um, but default search is not that. And also you will kind of like need to do your homework right and get the basics right. And all of these other features, I think, will only be able to, to work on top of that. Um, otherwise, you will still not get great results because you have the classic problems where you have data that needs cleaning up um, and you need to understand the kind of like the domain where you work. You will need to define the right synonyms. And only once you have done all of these things, will you then be able to brace out into more advanced technologies and make the most out of them. If you haven't done like the basics, all the advanced technologies on top will not um, solve your problems. Um, uh, 
I see co-locations. Um, so there are that are frequently used together. So um, that's that there's also an, an approach that so um, one one thing um, is that Elasticsearch can do frequencies, frequency analysis of your text. And then basically you say um, over all the things uh, or over all the text body that you have, um, you have some outliers um, where basically the, you try to break them up into foreground and background and you can find those. Um, it's basically um, that you, you find um, the most relevant combinations. There is such a thing. Um, but again, that's also not like basic full text search that I'm doing here. Um, but yes, there are there are these and like these um, frequently used things together or things that are like an outlier um, are a, a technology that we use quite frequently also for other use cases uh, like finding the reason why a service is suddenly failing because you have weird combinations. So there are ways to find these combinations. Um, but that's also probably too much for now. Um, the question, how does Elasticsearch compare to Google search? Um, well, I mean, Google search is, it does its thing, but you cannot really control it. Um, and you can just run that against the Google search and it will give you something and you can then limit it to the domain and then it will give you whatever it thinks. With Elasticsearch, um, you control the data and you have a much finer control over what you do. Also, um, you can influence the results. You probably want to do something like click tracking to see what people are searching for and what they're clicking on or not clicking on. Um, and then you want to refine your search. So if you are like have a bigger site or you want to invest more, you probably want to do that yourself and have a all the data and then learn from that and improve on that. Um, if you have like a small site or you have like your own blog and you just want to have some search, you can just use whatever Google provides. I hope that answers that question. Um, okay, so, so far we have only been simulating. Um, what I'm doing now is um, I'm adding an index. That's basically where we put all those JSON documents. I'm defining synonyms. So I'm saying father and dad are the same word. Droid and machine are not exactly the same word because a droid is a machine, but not every machine is a droid. So basically this is like a replacement. Droid gets replaced by droid and machine, but machine doesn't get replaced by droid. Um, so these are two synonyms that I define here and I call that my synonym filter. Um, and then I have this entire pipeline that we run through and it's the my synonym filter. Um, all of this here, um, we put into an analyzer that we call my analyzer. And then I say, I have a field that I call quote. And on that, it's a text. I apply that my analyzer. So that is basically the index. Um, it's not a table, but it's the, that would be kind of the equivalent concept in the relational world. Um, and now let me add those three documents. Those are the three documents that we have seen before. And it will tell me that it has inserted all three documents correctly. Um, now what you can do is, um, because I've added the document with the ID one, two, and three, I could just retrieve that document. And you can see it has some metadata around it. So source or underscore source, that was the document that I stored here. But it also has like, this is the index and the ID and some other fields. Um, you could also just rather than the entire document retrieve the source. This is pretty much what the database gives you. So you store something and you retrieve it, but that's not really the point of full text search. Um, this query here is more like a select star from Star Wars. Um, so that's a query and a match all. So this will find all three documents that we have added. Um, but we want to do full text search. So let's see what we can do in terms of full text search. If I search for droid, and you know that the droid that we have in our text body was lowercase and it was droids in the plural. Will I find that or will I not find that? 
And then you need to remember, okay, what happens in the background. So when the droid or the document with droids was stored, it was lowercase and then it was um, stamped down to droid. And when you search, your search runs through the same analysis as your stored documents. So droid will also be lowercase and it will be stamped, though there's no stemming change here. And then you can go for a direct match basically on droid. So what Elasticsearch has then, it's called an so-called inverted index, is the data structure. Um, let me show you an inverted index. Um, I have tried to simulate that for our use case here. Um, basically, what Elasticsearch stores in the background is it has an alphabetically sorted list of all the tokens we have extracted. Then it says the document IDs and says, Droid appears once in document one at position four. That's a so-called inverted index. And that's the index structure that is, or one of the index, index structures that Elasticsearch creates. And that is then used um, for the search. So rather than looking through all the texts for Droid, um, we take the Droid that we're looking for, we lowercase it, we stem it. Then we check in the alphabetically sorted list. Do we have Droid here? Yes, we do. Which, in which document does it appear? Only in document one at position four, which doesn't matter for that use case, but it appears once in document one. And then we can directly return the document one. So we don't need to look at the other documents. And that's why this creating this inverted index and extracting all of that information and preparing it up front is what makes full text search so much faster um, than doing the same operation or something like that um, in a relational database, which just stores the, the raw text. Um, so this here finds these are not the droids you're looking for. And it doesn't matter if it's singular or plural or whatever you do with that, um, that will always find that one droid that we have. Um, what happens if I search for dead? So if I search for dad, it will find father because we defined that synonym, that dad and father are the same. And by the way, um, it's really exactly the same. Um, there is no difference if one of the documents had dad and another one had father, they are treated exactly the same way. Um, dad wouldn't have more weight than father here in my searches. Um, you can also explain why something matches, but I'll skip over that um, because we only have 12 minutes left. If I search for machine, will we find the droid? Yes or no? What did we say? Every machine is a droid, but not every droid is a machine. So yes, if I search for machine, it will find my droid. So that works. You can also do a phrase search where I say for I am your father. And basically it says like all of these terms need to be there and they need to be exactly in this order. And that's where the inverted index, the positions come into play again. Um, and then it finds this one document here. Um, I'm not sure what the no is referring to, but if you give me a complete question, I will try to um, follow up or it was the answer to, to something here. Um, And um, one thing you can add um, is you can add a slop. And the slop is basically you have the phrase and all the words in the phrase are there, um, but there can be a word in between. So it's like a bit looser. So if you had here, um, I am father, and you had a slop one, it would still find it, even though there is your in between and you hadn't, haven't had that in your phrase. Will you find something if you search for this one here? I am not your father with a slop of one. And that one finds it, which is a bit confusing because I said all the words in our search need to be there. But then you need to remember no or not was a stop word. So this gets removed. And then you have the positions 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And basically, your and father that the position will be wrong by one, but that is being fixed by the slop. So that's why this document is still being found here, which might be a bit surprising. Um, then we have fuzziness. This was when, when we misspelled, we had the question before. So I misremembered how to spell Obi-Wan 
and I spell it like van. And, and then I can set the fuzziness to um, 0, 1, 2, or auto. Um, and that will still find my OB1, even though there was this misspelling. Um, auto basically means if you have 0 to 2 characters in your search term, auto fuzziness would mean 0 edits. If it's 3 to 5 characters, it would be fuzziness 1. If it's more than 5 characters, it would be fuzziness 2. That's basically what auto means. So it will adjust the edits based on the length of the query term. Um, and you could change that to the values 0, 1, or 2. In very early versions of Elasticsearch, like eight years ago or so, you could have higher fuzziness than 2. But that performed very badly. And also, like a lot of the search results were not so great. So that option was reduced. Um, what happens if I search for OV and VAN and I misspell both, both words and I have a fuzziness of one? Will I find something, yes or no? And I do find something. And now the question is why? And then you need to remember, we use the standard tokenizer. So OV and VAN are two tokens in the end. Um, and then each one of them gets one edit. And each one of them has one letter wrong. So that's why. We still find it here. But this is a bit confusing, to be honest, or you just need to know that. Um, by the way, um, i just like to point it out because it's, it's a nice story. So the initial implementation of fuzzy search in Lucene was brute force, which was obviously slow and not very smart. Um, by now, it has been replaced, or a couple of years ago, it has been replaced uh, by the so-called Levenstein automaton, which basically says, like here, um, the search we have here is food, and we have two edits. And this graph is basically, we need to find one possible path from the bottom left to the top right corner. Um, and that is how that Levenstein automaton works on when you search for food with two edits. Um, and it needs to find one path through that graph um, to fulfill that fuzziness and find something that matches. So. You could, of course, do that with a relational database and then have like these placeholders, but that is not going to be much fun. And it's also not going to be very fast. So you probably don't want to do that. Um, we have seven minutes left. Um, let's see if we can get that still done. Scoring. Something that I have not explicitly mentioned so far is that we always have this score here, like this weird number. And what the score is basically is, is how relevant is a document for my query? And the, the classic approach for that is called TFIDF, term frequency inverse document frequency. And um, when you search for one term, by now it has been replaced by a slightly adjusted algorithm, which call, is called BM25, which stands for best match 25. And actually I think that one has been updated to BM25F now, um, but um, that difference is very minor. Um, so that is how you search. And it has three main components or things, how you find or score the relevancy of your search terms against documents that you find. The first thing is the term frequency. Basically, you assume if I search for father and one document contains father once and another document contains father three times, the document that contains father three times is more relevant for my search. And it basically looks like this. Um, this is how many times does my search term appear? How relevant is my document? And you can see TFIDF was just square root and kept growing. Like five documents, 10, 15, it would still increase the relevancy. BM25 basically says like once you hit five or so hits of father, um, 10 or 15 fathers don't make that document much more relevant anymore. So it's really just tuning um, the curve or the details for that. Um, so that's the term frequency. Then you have the inverse document frequency that basically assumes over all the documents or all the occurrences in that field, how many times does a specific term appear? And the assumption is if something is very rare, it's valuable. Or to put it another way, something that appears very frequently, the relevancy of that is dampened. Um, so how that looks like is over all the documents for that field, how many times does my document or does this term appear? 
and how relevant is it? So if a term only appears like a couple of times, like maybe father in Star Wars, it's very relevant. If it appears hundreds of times, it's less relevant. So I don't know, Stormtrooper, for example, is probably less relevant here. So the relevancy is decreasing. Um, you can, by the way, tweak those curves, um, but I will avoid that for today. It's something that might, for some specific scenarios, make sense. In many cases, classic BM25 is probably good enough for what you're trying to do. Final thing in the three things that BM25 with TF, uh, IDF does is field length norm, basically it assumes if you have a short field and your search term appears there, it's more relevant than if you have a very long field, which makes sense because if your search term appears like in a short title and that is there, that is very relevant. If you have like a thousand tokens and, and that appears once in that, it's not so relevant anymore. So it's one divided by the square root of the number of terms for that field. Um, and then you can basically um, mesh all of that together. Um, uh, and that you can then have, I'll get back to this question in a moment since we only have three minutes left. Um, you can explain that on a query and it will basically show you all the individual pieces and how they are made up. Um, which looks something like this, and you ha will have all the numbers of how they are combined. Um, so for example, here, to put that together, you see I am your father has this relevancy here. Obi-Wan never told you what happened to your father, um, has a lower relevancy. The term frequency is the same. So we are assuming we're searching for father here. Um, the term frequency is the same. Both contain father once. The inverse document frequency is also the same because father appears twice over all our documents. The field length norm is the only thing that makes a difference here because this one here has only four tokens and this one here has more. So this one is less relevant than the other one. And yeah, if you put that into multiple terms, you have a very cool thing that is called vector space model, um, which looks something like this, like, how many times does your, or how relevant is each individual term? And then a document only containing one, for example, is would be here or here. And that is the combination. So a document that contains father, um, how relevant is a document that only contains father? Um, the, the smaller the angle here is, um, the more relevant it is. Um, if you have three, do, three terms that you're searching for, it will be three-dimensional, etc. So. Coming back to that question, um, features that I'm excited about in Elasticsearch. So one of the things that I think Elasticsearch is, so Elasticsearch as a general purpose data store is interesting. One of the things that I'm very excited about is, is making it smarter for a lot of use cases. Um, so we had that full text search example earlier on, and there are a couple of things where we figure out over time that for some scenarios, um, things make sense the way we store them and in others it doesn't. So we create more and more kind of like clever and more optimized data structures, both in terms of full text search, but also in other use cases like log analysis, for example, to reduce the storage size and to reduce the heap size that you have. And for me, that's kind of, um, or that's, a good feature because you use fewer resources, you scale better, um, and then you can build more advanced things on top of search. For example, one thing that you frequently do in full text search is that you don't analyze and store the text that you store just once, but multiple times, because the combination of searching across multiple variants often gives you better results. So reducing the, the resources that you need for that um, is a good thing. Um, I have, well, 50 seconds left. Um, query reformulation um, beyond uh, synonym replacement. So, I mean, query reformulation, I think there are two points to that. I mean, there is a query rewrite phase already, but that's mostly, that's not like a functional aspect but that's um, a performance aspect, like how the query is rewritten to write the optimal query for to actually get the data from Lucene. Um, if you need mean in terms of functionality, yes. 
um, though we don't have anything out for that right now. Um, so we have 10 seconds left. Um, there will be the magic button at the bottom. If you have any more questions, um, join me in the other area. Thanks for joining, everybody. See you.